I went to uh, RIT to study professional photography starting in 1970, and from there I veered off into the computer field, which was when my career was. But I've enjoyed photography as a hobby ever since. Um, what kind of camera do you use? Anybody have uh, like a big SLR, uh, cell phone camera, point and shoot? Um, it pretty much covers everything. And it really doesn't matter what kind of camera you've got. You can take good pictures with it regardless. So let's get right to the heart of the matter here, the rules for good photographs. Everybody ready? <laughs> Ansel Adams, um, one of the premier photographers of the early 20th century, said this. And what he's really saying is there's no one rule or set of rules that will guarantee you a good photograph every time. Um, and having said that, though, there are some things you can do which will increase your, uh, your, your odds of getting a picture that you really like. So let's take a look at some pictures first. And, and what I want you to do is first decide whether you like it or not. And if you like it, try and decide why. This is a great blue heron in Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge. By the way, this is a scan of a 35 millimeter slide, blown up now to approximately 6,000 times its original size. <laughs> this is Tenaya Lake in uh, Yosemite National Park. These are jet contrails. Uh, and this was taken in the Finger Lakes National Forest on the Interlock Trail. This is a magnolia tree in Highland Park. And this is a rose in Sonnenberg Gardens. Now, if you're if you're trying to make a photo, the first thing you have to decide, and sometimes it, it just happens automatically, what is the purpose of this photo? Um, record data. For example, you're taking insurance pictures of uh, stuff in your house in case there's an accident or a robbery accident. Preserve memories, you know, ordinary vacation pictures. Or make a pretty picture to hang on your wall. In each of these cases, all you have to do is please yourself. That's relatively easy. If you want a picture to sell to somebody else, now you got to please them. That's harder. Um, I offer pictures for sale on the internet. I don't want to say I sell pictures on the internet, because I rarely do. Um, and it's hard to sell photographs to people. So let's take a look at some techniques that you can use to get, perhaps, better results. The first thing is fill the frame. Whatever your subject is, make it fill the frame. We've all seen pictures of you know, the elk in the field. And the, in the picture, the elk is this little bitty dot. And there's all this real estate around the picture that's totally irrelevant, and it's in the way. Now, sometimes you just can't get close enough to the subject to fill the frame. But if you can, either by physically getting closer or by zooming in your lens, um, try and fill the frame as much as you can with your subject. Um, another thing is to Look around the edges of the viewfinder. Oftentimes, you'll have a very nice composition in the center of the viewfinder, but there's something kind of poking in from the outside of the frame, which is a distraction. You may be able to get rid of that distraction by zooming in a little bit or moving a little bit. I'm sure you've seen photographers out there doing this kind of thing. This is sometimes what they're doing, is getting rid of those distractions around the outside of the frame. Also, that's a whole lot easier to do if you put your camera on a tripod where it doesn't move. Now you can take your time and peer around and not worry that your hands are moving and uh, as you're getting rid of some distraction on one side of the frame, introducing a new one on the other side. And I have to admit I don't use a tripod anywhere near as often as I should. Um, and the result of that is I end up cropping my pictures more than I uh, otherwise would have to. One of the best uh, ideas that I've seen and it works well for me is what's called the rule of thirds. And the idea is to divide the frame of your picture into thirds, both vertically and horizontally. And imagine this as a big tic-tac-toe grid in the middle of the picture. The idea is to take something interesting in the, the, the subject and put it on one of these horizontal lines or one of the vertical lines or 
better yet, at any of these four intersections. Those are very powerful places inside your frame. Whoops, went one too far. So here's that uh, great blue heron, and look at where the heron's neck is. It's right on that line, and his body is right on one of those intersections. At Tenaya Lake, look at where the horizon is, right smack on the line. I did that on purpose. And on that line on the top, there's this nice line of clouds. That was kind of accidental. I hadn't seen that when I was taking the picture, but I think it adds some to the picture. And these groups of rocks in the foregrounds, they're kind of near those lower two intersections. The uh, sunset on the Interlochen Trail, the big tree is right on that left vertical line. The little tree on the right isn't anywhere near any of these things, but I like it where it is because it kind of adds some balance to the picture. And here's a close-up of a sunflower. I took this 1986 or something like that. Again, this is a scan of a 35 millimeter slide. I showed this in another presentation, and someone said, well, why didn't you center that? That should be centered. Well, that would be another way to do it. But I think it has, I don't want to say more energy, but that's kind of where I'm coming from. I don't want to get all new age on you here. Um, but it, I think it's more dynamic this way. Plus, with the center of the flower up here, I'm able to get more detail in the petals down in this corner without having to zoom out and make everything small. And one nice thing I like about this picture, look at the grains of pollen that have fallen down on the petals. I think that's really cool. This is uh, a top Mount Mansfield in Stowe, Vermont. I rode up the ski lift in the winter. Everyone else is carrying their skis and I've got my big 4x5 camera instead. And I'm standing on the deck in the lodge, uh, looking up the mountain. Everyone else is skiing the other direction down the mountain. And I just love this picture, primarily because of the, the magical light up in those pine trees in the snow. But if you look at the intersections and the lines, there's interesting stuff in the frame near all those, those, uh, those good spots. Other things that help composition, if you can make both the foreground and the background interesting, that's good. Uh, diagonal lines are attractive. Here's a picture of Grizzly Lake in Yellowstone National Park. And obviously these trees in the foreground, they have these nice diagonals that uh, look good in the composition. But the, uh, the tree line on the left is another diagonal line. And let's look at the uh, tic-tac-toe right here. And it turns out the trees here are close to this intersection. Look at this one over here. There's these vertical trees and their reflections right near this vertical line. And again, I didn't see that when I took the picture, but I think it, uh, I think it helps the picture. This is the Norris Geyser Basin in Yellowstone, uh, obviously in the winter. The uh, tree lines form this nice crossing diagonal uh, pair of lines. If we put the tic-tac-toe grid in, uh, the, uh, both of those diagonals go through the uh, intersections, the upper left and the lower right intersection. But getting back to Ansel, there are times when you have to break the rules. Uh, if, if the rule of thirds doesn't work, don't slavishly adhere to it. Do what works for you. Here's an example. This is Quaker Lake in Allegheny State Park. Uh, I took this picture early morning uh, in the fall, and I really enjoy it. But if we put the tic-tac-toe grid in, none of the elements in the picture are where they ought to be. So, for the purpose of this talk, I cropped the picture a little differently. And now, this upper line is right on the horizon, and in fact, the tip of this, uh, not this point of land, but the one behind it, comes right to that intersection. This uh, bunch of stuff in the foreground here is, is near that intersection. In some ways, this is a much stronger composition. But what we're missing is those, well, let me take the lines out and you can see picture all by itself. What we're missing in this cropping is those pretty pink clouds up in the sky, which I really like. So I, 
I keep this one. Here's one that doesn't follow any of the, uh, certainly not the tic-tac-toe rules. This one, it's the color and the reflections. And by centering the shoreline, I maximize the amount of each that I get in the picture. So I like that one this way. By the way, that is uh, Mason Lake in the Adirondacks. And this is a scarlet macaw at the Bird Kingdom in Niagara Falls, Canada. And I just got close enough to the bird that there was nothing else in the frame. And this is, it's all texture and color. Uh, so I'm not even going to bother with the tic-tac-toe grid on this one. Okay, focusing. These days, the cameras focus themselves. In the olden days, you had to focus it on your own. And that was an advantage because it gave you the choice of where you wanted to focus. Now the camera decides where it wants to focus. Maybe it's where you want, maybe not. Uh, the earlier cameras focused on whatever was in the center of the scene, but more modern cameras these days will try to pick out the main element of the scene. Often that's whatever is closest to the camera. Uh, but these days, cameras will also pick out faces, and focus on faces. The point is, if the camera is focusing somewhere that's not where you want to focus, what can you do? Many cameras, you can override the focus by pressing the shutter release button halfway down. You point the camera in such a way that it chooses the focus point you want. Press the shutter release button halfway down. That locks the focus. Now you can recompose the picture and press the button the rest of the way to take it. And here's an example of that. The subject here, of course, is the bird. Um, and it's way off at the edge of the frame. So what I did was aim at the bird, press the button halfway down, recompose the picture the way I wanted it, and press it the rest of the way to take the picture. If the falls had been in focus and the bird had been out of focus, I don't think this picture would have worked. Here's one. This is the Inca stone construction at Machu Picchu. And the subject here is really the stone. So I let the mountain in the background with the flag on top go a little bit out of focus, and that helps draw your eye to the parts that are sharp. But again, to do that, I had to move the camera off to the side and get it to focus where I wanted it to focus. Here is a fall shot in Letchworth State Park. This is on the east side of the park, which you can get into for free, by the way. Uh, the first thing you see when you look at this picture is this big splash of color on the left. On the right, though, after a while, you notice the people, and that balances the color on the left. And in my mind, the people are really the subject. Uh, you get to enjoy vicariously their experience of looking at this wonderful fall color. Along with autofocus, modern cameras have auto exposure. However, the camera is never as smart as your brain is. Uh, and what the exposure meters tend to do is to assume from the beginning that every scene has an average luminance or, or brightness, uh, ranging from total black to complete glaring white. The camera meter tries to average all that. And if the scene you're photographing is overall dark to begin with, or light to begin with, then the camera is going to make a mistake. If the scene you're photographing has very high contrast, more contrast than the camera can record, then you're guaranteed to lose some of the image. Now, if you have a camera with uh, manual control, you can override the camera's decisions and correct some of these problems. In the case of the high contrast scenes, you can choose, do I want the shadows or the highlights? Which is more important to this picture? Which would, would hurt less if I lost it? If you want to make the scene lighter in the photo, give it more exposure. If you want to make it darker, give it less exposure. Um, and with your manual controls on the camera, you can do that easily. And the neat thing about digital, of course, is you can check your results right away. And if it didn't come out the way you want it, you can fix it and try again. But even if I take a shot that didn't work very well, I always keep it for post-processing on the computer later. It may be the shot that I thought was just right. When I look at it later, there's something wrong with it, like it was blurry or something 
that's poking in from the edge of the frame that's a distracting element. And I might be able to take that, that suboptimal shot that I took earlier and fix it on the computer and make it better. Here, for example, is a uh, lily flower in Thailand. And this was a, a dark scene. So when the camera exposed for this scene, it lightened everything to make it um, an average luminance. And what I saw when I looked at this scene was this lily flower. The, the petals were dark and saturated in color, and the inner part of the flower was just glowing. But the camera didn't see it that way. So what I did was use my manual adjustment and underexposed by one stop. One stop is photographer jargon for let in exactly half the amount of light you let in before. And this is the result. Now the flower is much more saturated in color. The, uh, the center of it glows much more like I remembered it. And the rest of the stuff is darker and not as obtrusive when you're looking at the photograph. Here is a picture of the Wat Rong Khun Temple, also known as the White Temple, in Chiang Rai, Thailand. The camera did pretty well with this uh, particular scene, but I wanted something a little more dramatic. And my first thought was, well, I'll underexpose it by a stop, let in half the light, that'll darken the sky. What I did instead was move a little bit to a slightly different angle. And now, sunlight is reflecting off of these mirrored facets on the temple. So a lot more light is coming into the camera, and the meter sees that, and the meter now decides to give it less exposure than it did before. So this time, the meter did what I would have done, and the result is a more dramatic picture, I think. Lenses. Well, the normal lens is supposed to give you the normal human field of view, whatever that means. Humans, our brains uh, are the smartest part of the visual system that we've got. If you're looking at a scene and there's something in the distance that captivates your interest, boom, your eyes go immediately to it, and your brain ignores everything else that's there. But if you're looking at this broad panorama, you can see the whole thing without concentrating on any particular details. So tell me, what is the normal field of view? Uh, telephoto lenses, well, that's easier to define. It brings distant things in closer, makes them bigger in the picture. That's what you want for that element that's way out in the field, so you make it more than just a little dot in the picture. Wide angle lenses see a wider angle. They take things and move them further from the camera so you can see more on the sides and the top and the bottom. And zoom lenses, of course, combine all of these. Now, I want to spend some time on perspective. Perspective is nothing more than the apparent sizes of different things in your picture. And the apparent sizes of things is determined solely by how far they are from you. If you have two objects the same size, for example, two utility poles by the side of the road, if you're standing right next to one of them, it looks a whole lot taller than the next one down the line. But if you look at the 20th utility pole down the road, it looks pretty much the same size as the 21st. In the first case, the pole is a whole lot nearer to you than the next one. But when you look at the 20th pole, the difference between its distance and the next one's distance is minuscule. So their apparent size is very similar. Now, there's a misconception that wide-angle lenses have this wonderful perspective. And the misconception is it's not the wide-angle lens that's doing it. It's you standing closer to the subject that, do, that does it. So, as an example, here's a picture of my sister's house, former house, in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Now, the hill in the background is way taller than the house. But I'm standing way closer to the house than I am standing close to the hill. So the house looks bigger relative to the hill. But if I move back a little bit... <laughs> now, I'm almost a mile away from the houses at this point taking a picture with this telephoto lens to bring the houses closer to me. Since I'm so much further away from the houses now than I was before, the houses look way smaller than they did before. But I was five, six, seven, eight miles away from the mountains in the first place. I added another mile to that. Not much of a difference. So the mountains have not changed in size as much. 
It's where you're standing that determines the perspective, not the lens you're using. Here's another example. This was taken in Highland Park. Well, we saw this from Pulse, the magnolia tree. I'm using a 12 millimeter lens here. Now, for those of you familiar with 35 millimeter cameras and lenses, it's the equivalent of an 18 millimeter lens, 35 millimeter camera, very wide angle. And I'm literally six inches away from these near blossoms. I'm standing this far from them with the camera. Now, the near blossoms are real near to the camera, but these blossoms back in the distance, they're several feet away, way further than the nearer ones. So the near ones seem much bigger in the photo. I hope nobody out there speaks Thai. This is the Wat Phra That Suthong Mang Phung Kiri Temple, also known as the Reclining Buddha. The only reason I'm showing you this is, look at the staircase. That's how it really looks. Now, I put my wide angle lens on and got right up close to the staircase. Looks different. Now, the near stairs are so much closer to me than the far ones way up at the top. They look huge relative to the far ones, and that's what gives you this perspective. And since I'm looking up at these nagas, these uh, seven-headed uh, snakes, it gives them a real interesting look as well. Close-ups can provide a very interesting perspective, and also can provide a lot of detail that you might not otherwise see in a photograph taken from further away. The first example is one we've seen already. I pointed out the pollen and the, the, the grains of pollen in the center of the flower. Close-up lenses. Um, if you have a point-and-shoot camera, it may have a close-up setting or a macro setting. Sometimes this only works when the lens is zoomed all the way out to the telephoto setting. But that's not true on all cameras. Uh, for bigger cameras, uh, cameras with interchangeable lenses, you can get macro lenses specifically. And they're different from ordinary lenses in that they are corrected for objects close to the lens. Ordinary lenses are corrected for distortions and so forth. For objects average to longer distances away, but macro lenses are corrected for objects that are much closer. And because of that, you can get much sharper pictures if you're able to use one. And at this point, I need to talk about depth of field a little bit. Because depth of field becomes very important when, uh, especially when you get close to a subject. What depth of field is is simply the range of distances from the camera in which the subject will be acceptably sharp. Strictly speaking, if you focus on a particular distance, say two feet, only subjects that are actually two feet will be perfectly sharp. But parts of the subject that are a little further than that, or a little closer than that, will be sharp enough that they look okay in photograph. If you go too much further or too much closer, now it's blurry enough that it's obvious. Depth of field is that little bit of range where the subject is sharp enough to be accepted. Now, when you're focusing at objects that are way far away, the depth of field is much larger. When you're focusing at objects closer, the depth of field is smaller. And at macro distances, like inches, the depth of field is minuscule. So one way to increase the depth of field is to stop down the lens. And this is photographer talk for taking the aperture in the lens, the opening, and making it smaller. The lens has an aperture just like your eye when it's bright out your eye stops down, and when it's dim, that iris in your eye opens up. Same thing in the camera. If you stop down that aperture in the camera, it increases the depth of field. And you might say, cool, why don't we do that all the time? Then everything in my photograph is going to be sharp. Well, here's an example. Uh, this was taken with a macro lens. I'm standing probably three feet from the subject, and the, the subject is parallel to the camera. So all of this is the same, roughly the same distance from the camera, so the, the entire wing is in focus. The background is further, it's out of focus, it's out of the range of depth of field. The rows that we saw before, you can begin to see in the center it's very sharp, up at the top it's sharp, in the foreground, now it's getting blurred. 
I'm so close now that the depth of field is small enough I cannot get the entire bloom in focus, even though I stopped the lens down quite a bit. Don't you mind not touching this? It'll shake. I'm sorry. I love this one. Anyone know what this is? Pardon? A moth, yes. This is the Atlas moth. The moth is about this big from wingtip to wingtip. This was also at the Butterfly Conservancy in uh, Niagara Falls. Great place to go, by the way. This particular antenna was pretty much parallel to the camera, so it's uniformly sharp. This one was poking right out at me. And you can see very clearly, right up, oh, I had to get my laser pointer. Right up here, it's sharp. As you move closer and closer, it gets more and more blurry. As you move further back from that sharp point, it gets blurry again. You can clearly see the limited range of depth of field. That, oh, cool. <laughs> Audience participation, I love it. You can clearly see the limited depth of field. The acceptably sharp area is probably about an inch or an inch and a half. So I want to stop down the lens. Well, doing that will increase the depth of field, but it has some drawbacks. It lets less light into the camera. And in order to compensate for that, you have, oh, Sam, thank you, my savior. Thanks. In order to compensate for that, you have to leave the shutter open longer, which makes it more likely that you're going to get blurred from jiggle. You have to use, another way is to use a higher sensitivity in the sensor and the camera. But that means it increases the noise in the sensor, which is sort of analogous to grain for film photographs. Um, and, or put more light on the subject. And sometimes you can do that, for example, with flash. Sometimes you can't. So sometimes you're just not able to, uh, to increase the depth of field. But if you have this limited depth of field beak, and the eyes were out of focus, this would be a picture of a beak. <laughs> But focusing on the eyes, it's a picture of a bird. And he looks rather irritated at me. <laughs> okay. Ansel says a good photograph is knowing where to stand. I think he's half right. The other half of that is once you're standing in the right place, you have to know where to point it. <laughs> but if you're standing in the right place, you'll probably see where to point it. Um, and I generalize that by saying, look for the angle. Try and figure out what it is that excites you about the subject. Why did you want to take a picture of that in the first place? Whatever aspect of the subject was the coolest part, try and find an angle that emphasizes that aspect and de-emphasizes everything else. For example, back in Yosemite, this is on uh, Olmsted Point, by the way, I found this tree, this tortured tree. I just could imagine the, the struggles it had gone through as it had grown. And I wanted to take a picture of it to, to show that. So I used a, a large aperture in my lens to try and throw the background out of focus, but this doesn't work. There's, the background is too distracting. So all I did was walk around and look for a different angle. And I came upon that. Now, with the sky in the background, the subject stands out. and. Actually, I like the rock in there, too. It's sort of like, you know, the immovable object meets the irresistible force kind of thing. This was in uh, Allegheny State Park, obviously, in the fall. I wanted to uh, contrast the yellow leaves with the green needles and pine trees, but without all the direct in the background, the parking lot, the cars, the picnic tables, the charcoal grills. So I just looked up. And I liked the result. And the... The trees receding into the distance give me these nice diagonal lines that I think adds to the composition. This is a lady slipper in Sapsucker Woods. I took this in about 1976, and I'm lying on the ground, lying on my belly. The camera is about a foot off of the ground. The light was provided by two electronic flashes, one on either side of the flower. And the flashes were much closer to the flower than they were to the rest of the stuff in the background. Consequently, the light falls off in the background, which leaves the background dark, not black, but dark enough not to be distracted from the flower. 
Now compare this in your mind to what you would have gotten if you had been walking along. Oh, look, there's a lady slipper. Click. So again, look for the angle. Here's one I took not long ago. This is in Linwood Gardens in North, uh, pardon me, York, New York. And I like this little yellow flower in the midst of all this green foliage. But this angle is no good. The flower is lost. So again, I just moved around a little bit. And I found this angle, which emphasizes the flower much better. And what I should have done on this photo, notice the flower, it's all washed out here. I should have adjusted the exposure to fix that. But I was using a new point and shoot camera that I had just gotten. I hadn't learned how to do that yet. Oh well. Back in the days of black and white, we used to use filters all the time to get various different effects. In the days of color, most of them don't do anything for us anymore. But the only filter I still use is the polarizing filter. And what this does is block out polarized light, uh, and it reduces reflections and glare. Also increases the color saturation. And the most common thing that people use a polarizer for is to darken blue skies, which works fine if you point it in the right direction. Um, we've got polarized sunglasses, Margaret and I. We're always going, she's laughing. Don't tell them all our secrets, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Me especially. We go around, we look at some scene, and I'm going like this. And what I'm doing is changing the polarizing angle in my glasses to see what the effect is, to see if I want to bother dragging the polarizer filter out of my camera bag. Wait. Here's an example where I used a polarizing filter, darkened the sky to increase the, uh, the effect that I wanted with the tree. Another thing that you can do with a polarizing filter, when light reflects off of a surface, the reflected light becomes polarized to some extent. The polarizing filter eliminates this glare. That's like glare off of a window. And if you eliminate that glare, then you can see what's really behind the window. In this particular case, I'm standing here. The bush is here. The sun is up there, shining towards me. You can see the glare I'm getting of the sun off of these leaves. Again, this was with my point-and-shoot camera. I took off my polarized sunglasses, held it up in front of the lens of the camera, rotated the sunglasses so I could see what was going on on the LCD screen, and took the picture and got that result. Eliminates the glare. Same spot, same angle, only difference was the polarizer. And one thing that I learned, and I've not seen this mentioned, very many other places, a polarizing filter can enhance rainbows. Here was a picture taken in Crawford Notch in New Hampshire, and there was, it was a misty day, but the sun was out behind us. So the sunlight in that mist is what created this rainbow. And I took the picture, and I'm about to walk away, and I thought, wait a minute, I should try my polarizer. Makes it better. And now, you can begin to see the second rainbow up here. Okay, back in the old days, you took your picture, you sent it off to the lamp, and the prints came back. Or, if you're lucky, you took a picture, you went down in your dark room, you played around all day to get one nice print, uh, and in your own dark room, there's a whole bunch of adjustments you could make to make the picture look the way you wanted it to look as Ansel Adams would say, to make the picture evoke the same response that the scene originally evoked in you. The kinds of errors you can correct in the darkroom, exposure errors to some extent, color balance if you're working in color, uh, cropping. You can do all those things on the computer these days, and you can do it a lot easier than you could back then. The one thing you cannot correct is focusing errors. If the subject is blurry, about all you can do is, well, you got two choices. Make some abstract picture out of it or throw it away. Actually, there's a third choice. The latest version of Photoshop, which I just got, has a new tool that attempts to sharpen a picture that has blurred because of camera movement. But it's very limited in the situations in which it will work. It will only work if the camera has moved in one direction. So you get streaks. If the subject is just blurry, it doesn't do a thing. 
So, if it's not sharp, I throw it out. This one's sharp. This was in the Columbus. Columbus? Yes, Columbus Zoo. Okay. A lot of uh, the changes you can make on the computer will enhance the picture. What, what is the challenge to me is to not take this too far. It's easy to take these changes too far and the picture looks fake. I've seen, my dad sends me stuff that he gets on the internet. A lot of these are collections of photographs and many times they'll have titles like, When God Paints. <laughs> and to me, these things all look way over-processed, way oversaturated. It's like, uh, it's like someone was trying to recreate a, a pastel scene with tempera paints. So my challenge is not to go too far, especially with the color bands. Here's an example. This is a lorikeet uh, in the Columbus, Ohio Zoo. Took this picture last August. Um, and especially with animals, often you can't get the exact composition you want. Because the animal's moving around. You can't nail them down onto the perch like they did in Monty Python. <laughs> so you have to take what you can get. And I kept this photograph because it was sharp. You know, the bird is flitting from branch to branch, and a lot of the rest of them weren't sharp. But it's a lousy composition. There's all kinds of distracting detail. It has nothing whatever to do with the bird. So I'm going to try and crop that out. And on the computer, this is what I got. And this is much better. But when I looked at this, I looked at the feathers up here, and the colors are all saturated and bright and brilliant. And I get down here, and it's this kind of washed out, icky, sort of lukewarm red. I thought I don't like that very much. Well, try another one. Get rid of the red stuff. Ah, now it's better. If the picture weren't sharp to begin with, I couldn't have cropped it this much, and especially blown it up to this size on the screen and still have it be accepted. So again, sharpness, that you have to worry about when you're taking the picture. But I think the moral of this story is if you crop it and you get something good, don't stop. Try something else. You might get something better. If you don't, you can always throw out your, uh, the things that didn't work. It doesn't cost you a thing. Here's another picture I took at the same zoo. The camera made an exposure decision here that I didn't agree with, but I didn't notice it at the time. My recollection of this flower was that it was more saturated, a richer red color. So I thought, let me see if I can correct that with the, uh, by making the thing a little darker. And this is the result I got. This is more similar to what I remember seeing. This is Olmsted Point. By the way, that's the backside of Half Dome right there. Um, this is the picture exactly as it came out of the camera. Usually I don't show people things like this. See the spots up here? That's dust on the camera's image sensor. The contrast in the picture is way low. There's a guy eating his lunch off on the side of the frame here. I didn't have the camera on a tripod, so I couldn't see that. So I'm going to try and fix all these things on the computer. And what I did was crop it some to get rid of the, the picnicker. I changed the contrast, cleaned up the dust spots, and now I've got a much nicer picture. This is uh, Granite Mountain, Scottsdale, Arizona. They have great sunsets out there. But when I saw this picture on the computer, boy, I thought it was more dramatic than that. And when I took the picture, I didn't notice the high tension power line down there. Damn. Well, maybe I can fix it. So I goosed up the contrast a little bit to enhance the color. I took a lot of time to get rid of that, uh, uh, the utility pole without having artificial looking smudges in the clouds, and I think this is a much nicer picture. Anybody recognize this? Lower Falls of Letchworth. It's taken from that stone bridge that goes over the river. Here's an example of a high contrast situation. The sky is too light, the river is too dark. Fortunately, the sensor on the camera still records detail in these areas, even though it comes out looking washed out 
up at the top and true dark down at the bottom. So on the computer, we can adjust that. And what I did was to make, let's see, I exposed for the sky when I took the picture to make sure I didn't lose detail in the clouds. Then I increased the contrast of the sky on the computer so that the clouds stood out. I increased the saturation of the color in the trees a little bit and then lightened the river quite a bit. And now it looks much more balanced to me, much more the way I saw it when I was standing there. And here's our last example that we're going to do. This is, again, the magnolias. This is the picture right as it came out of the camera. Good butt shot there, which I didn't notice. <laughs> It's, and it's not Margaret's. She wants to be sure that I point that out. <laughs> so I'm going to do four things to fix this picture. Thing number one, crop it. That gets rid of the pedestrian. Thing number two, I'm going to adjust the exposure and the contrast. When I took this picture, my uh, usual technique was to have the camera set to record lower than normal contrast. And my theory was if I did that, I could record a wider range of brightnesses and then be able to fix it later in the computer. I'm not sure that really worked, but that was what I was doing. So now I'm going to adjust the contrast and the exposure to compensate for how I had set the camera. Third thing I'm going to do is darken the foreground some so it's less distracting. And the final thing I'm going to do is increase the color saturation a little bit, just in the center of these front blooms. So one by one, we'll do these adjustments. First is cropping. There goes the person. Second, adjust exposure and contrast. Third, darken the foreground. And finally, you're going to have to watch close for this one. Increase the saturation in the center of these uh, near blossoms. I'll go back on that one because that's subtle. Here it is again. Just a little bit. And I think that this is the picture I ended up with. Now, when I go through this sequence and look at it here, my reaction is, gee, did I go too far? But when I look at this picture in the beginning of the show, without having seen the way it originally was, it looks fine. That's, that's the real test. Now, one last thing. Smartphones. <laughs> Margaret's new smartphone has a six megapixel camera in it. That's the same resolution as the big Nikon, my first digital Nikon that I got in 19, no, 2004. But it's a very different way of taking pictures. So are there any special techniques that will be helpful for smartphone cameras? Well, number one, get close. Fill the frame with your subject. We've already talked about this one. Number two, don't zoom. On a lot of these smartphone cameras, the zoom is accomplished not with a lens, but by cropping the image. And when you crop the image, you're throwing away pixels. And what's left is then enlarged, and the pixels become bigger, and it becomes grainy. So if you can, get close. Number three, get a tripod, especially when the subject is dark. And you say, well, wait a minute, there's no tripod screw on my smartphone. Go to Google and type in smartphone tripod bracket and you'll see all kinds of solutions to solve this problem. Number four, take lots of shots from different angles until you run out of memory. It doesn't cost you anything to do that, just time. And then you'll have lots of possibilities to choose from later. Try different camera apps. Now, I don't know if this is true of all smartphones, but on some of them, the camera app that comes with the camera you're not limited to that. There's others you can get. Some of them are free. You may try them. You may, like, you may find the one that you like better. Don't rely on the flash. On a lot of these, the flash is just an LED that lights up. It's not a you know, xenon flash tube that pumps out gazillions of lumens. It's look for other sources of light, let me put it that way. Uh, keep it clean. I don't know about you, but Margaret's cell phone does not have a lens cap to go over the cap on the camera. Um, and so it's in, there, in her uh, fanny pack and it's, you know, juggling around with all the other stuff in there. Clean it off once in a while, it'll help. And finally, share your memories. 
There's all kinds of places you can publish your photos. Uh, Snapfish.com, Shutterfly.com are two places that allow you to put them on the web or make photo books. Um, go to Google and type in make photo book and you'll get a, a whole slew of possibilities you can try. And finally, I've got one more thing to say, and that is this whole presentation, I put it as a PDF on my website, kmrconsulting.com. If you go to my home page, uh, about a third of the way down the page, there's a, a sentence there that says, oh, enjoy, I also hope you enjoy my gallery photographs and my presentation on making better pictures. Uh, so if you want to see this again, by all means, go to it. And I've also, in that version of this presentation, I've put a lot of text in there to replace the audio that you're hearing now. Um, and I spend a lot more time thinking about what I write down than when I do this off the top of my head. So anyway, there it is. I'd be happy to try and answer questions if anybody has any. Yes? Uh, Adobe Photoshop? To Adobe Photoshop. depends on how fast your computer is, but with the machine that and your experience, yeah, the real time is the learning curve of Photoshop itself. Photoshop is like Everest. I'm maybe a third of the way up to base camp, but I can do the kinds of things I usually want to do, so I have a little motivation to look into the, what I would call the more arcane uh, modifications you can make. Other questions? Yes? Are, you, are your photos for sale on your website? Some of them are. Um, and again, you can get that link there. Um, thanks for the plug, by the way. <laughs> um, but my experience is it's hard to sell photos. I can't say for sure, but my inkling is that people go to the photo site and they look at the picture. Wow, that's a really pretty picture. Where do you take it? Oh, there's somebody. Well, I was going to go there next summer. I'll take that picture when I'm there. And they may not realize that the photographer has gone out 42 different days before the light was finally right. Yeah. You know, and carries $3,000 worth of equipment that your cell phone camera is not going to be able to match. Anyway, other questions? Yes? Um, again, the Magnolia picture. Yeah. Why did you get such great depth of field when you were so close to it? Extreme wide angle lens. That increases the depth of field, and I also stopped it way down. The combination of those two is what did it. Very nice. Thank you. I was wondering, can you use the lenses from a 35 millimeter film camera on a 35 millimeter digital camera? When I got my first digital camera, it was a Nikon. I had had a Nikon film camera previously with Nikon and Canon and uh, I don't know about any of the other manufacturers. <laughs> the lenses from your 35 millimeter camera will work on the digital cameras. Originally, the sensors on the digital cameras were smaller. With Nikon and Canon, you can still get cameras with smaller sensors. The effect of that is your lens becomes somewhat more telephoto than it was on your film camera. I like that for the kind of stuff I do, taking pictures of animals. I get that extra reach to make the animal bigger in the frame. The short answer is generally yes. Check with the manufacturer's website. They'll tell you for sure. Um, that make lenses to go on things like your smartphone? Oh yes, Margaret found somebody sells lenses that attach to the front of your smartphone. Okay. What? Uh, there's a fisheye one, a wide angle one, was there a tall photo one? Yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch. Um, so, you know. Ken? Yes? Uh, if I would make a suggestion, we're running out of time. Okay. Ken will oh. be around after the meeting if you have any questions. Yes. And one last thing I will say, if you didn't have a pencil and paper to write that website down on, I brought a bunch of these strip calendars, which is my advertising. It's made to go on the top of your computer monitor. Feel free to come up and grab one. And that has that same URL on it. Thank you for your kind attention.